about the the main type of coordinate systems that we're going to use. We're gonna, uh, in fact, they, they overlap a little bit, uh, as we're going to see here. Uh, we've got a couple problems coming up where it's very easy to look at the problem in terms of two of the coordinate systems we used. Uh, the normal tangential coordinate system is very, very useful for some kind of curved path, which is pretty common, uh, certainly a circular path in all kinds of different machines and the like. It's very, very common. But uh, we tend to see things well in the Cartesian coordinate system, so we'll relate the two as we go through this business uh, for the next couple weeks. What I want to look at now is this idea of relative motion. <coughs> what we mean by that is how the motion of one object looks to another object, as if you were in a car looking at other cars going in other directions, other speeds, with other accelerations. There's a, a motion that you perceive that car to have as if you were in a stationary coordinate system, not moving. Everybody's experienced this, I think, at some time or other. Um, if you've ever been uh, in a parking lot and the car next to you starts to move, when you notice that it starts to move, but you think that you're the one moving, uh, then you panic and reach for the brake. You ever gone through that? Yeah, especially yeah. after a few beers. <laughs> <laughs> he said it, I did And this is one of the students over 21, so uh, uh, you Also, it's, it's very interesting if you ever are on an airplane, you look out and you see another airplane flying by. It looks like they're sort of skidding sideways when you know that, that uh, most likely they're flying in a straight line. So that's the idea of relative motion. It's pretty easy to set up for us so that we can get right into it. So uh, some, some object maybe my car moving with some velocity and some acceleration and it doesn't matter which direction these things are. I have to arbitrarily pick something just so I can draw it. And we're worried about how that looks to another car, in this case I guess a, a pickup truck, going some other velocity, maybe more, maybe less, maybe the same, could be any possibility, and uh, just for uh, uh, interest sake we'll say that the acceleration is in the other direction. So we have two cars traveling in the same direction. The car behind is picking up speed, the car in front is decreasing in speed, but it doesn't matter. It's all, it's all uh, well, as we're going to see, it's all relative. Uh, so we can establish it, our business here first if we come up with some kind of <coughs> position between the two. So from some arbitrary origin, we'll say that car A is at some position, some point, and of course that's varying with time since he has velocity, but it allows us to locate these two uh, objects um, from some arbitrary reference. Now the relative motion that we're concerned with is going to start first with the relative position. So uh, for example, uh, if you're in car A and you look down at car B, it appears to be that distance away. That's the position of B relative to A. So that's going to be our, our uh, subscript notation for relative motion now on. So this little bit here reads as B relative to A. How things look to how things look in A as you look out at B. What is B doing relative to what A is doing? That's very easy to set up from what we've got here. It's simply going to be X B minus 
x a. And that's the relative position of b with concern to a. And <coughs> drew it as one dimension, handled it fine without uh, any vector signs, but it's just as true if we did this in two and three dimensions. This is a full vector equation. And the book presents it a little bit differently. What the book likes to do is say, uh, I'll just write it down and I'll show you why I don't like to use it myself. Uh, it will do something like the position of B is the position of A plus the relative position between them. If you notice, the uh, two equations are exactly the same thing. I prefer this, and the choice for you is purely up to you. I prefer this just because it's so much easier to remember. B, A in that order, B, A in that order. You know, if, I do, if I do this, I always have to remember what's the order here on the B and A. It's, it's just harder for me. My, my uh, limited brain power just does an awful lot easier with that business there. So, do as you wish, uh, but that's what, uh, that's what works for me. They're the same thing anyway. It doesn't really matter. But that will always be the case. We're always reading this as B relative to A, and it's always the difference <coughs> between the two in that order. Well, the next step, I guess, then becomes what's the relative velocity between the two? And that is nothing more than the uh, time derivative of that equation. So the velocity of B relative to A. If you were in car A, how fast would and in what direction would B appear to be moving? For a, a case like this, um, We've all seen this on the highway. You can very easily imagine as you're picking, uh, catching up to a car in front of you, it can seem as if that car is coming back to you. And that's the relative motion we're talking about. And again, it's just the time derivative of the position equation and has exactly the same form as does the position equation itself. <coughs> Without any great stretch, then of course the acceleration equation follows. And there's everything you need to know for relative motion. Except we'll find in a minute that there's a little bit more to the acceleration equation than just appears there. But, uh, uh, we'll get to that when we get to a particular type of problem when that shows up. So that's it. That's all the preparation I can give you for relative motion. Oh, no, I can't. I can do something else. The, we actually have two types of relative motion. In this case, the two objects that we're talking about are independent of each other. There's nothing that A does that's going to affect what B does in terms of its velocity, acceleration, and position. Other than you can throw in crashes and the like, but that's an entirely different point. Uh, these are independent um, objects, and so we call this unconstrained relative motion. I mean, the two are, the two are free to move as they will, as they where, as they what, and they're completely independent of each other. So we've got everything we need. Maybe we'll put the position vector as something a little bit more generic than using x. Allows us just to be a little more general with uh, two-dimensional motion, even three-dimensional. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Bless you, it's all the same. So I'm just writing down what I've got there so we can do some other things on the board. And then the acceleration equation. That's it. That's all I can 
do for you on this relative motion other than let's try a couple. And most of them are very easily put into uh, things like uh, uh, travel type equation uh, problems and the like. So let's imagine a train traveling at constant speed along a track. There's the smoke. So we're looking at it from above. And uh, it's got a velocity of 60 miles per hour. And it passes over a freeway. On which a car is driving, and we want to find out the relative position of the two, or relative velocity of the two. So the velocity of the car is 45 miles per hour. And the uh, two travel paths are about uh, are 45 degrees apart. So let's find the velocity of the train relative to the car. So, first thing you need to ask, given that question, find B rel of train relative to car, which is B and which is A? Because if you get them wrong, then you have the opposite of the answer we're looking for. Because R A relative to B is just the opposite of B relative to A. So we have to have the, the letters straight um, to even use the proper equation. So which is B, which is A? I want to find the velocity of something relative to something. Whichever letter comes first determines what vector algebra, vector arithmetic we do next. What did you say, John? Well, no, I need, I need two letters here. I need the train and the car. Is it T relative to C or C relative to T? TC. TC is John's wild guess. Well, I thank John for coming today. Bill? It's T relative to C. Yeah? T relative to C. It's, it's uh, the shorthand notation for those words, and we'll always take it to read that way. Uh, might not specifically have it in those words, so you have to be careful as we get a little better than these, but it's uh, then nothing more than the difference between those two vectors. In that order. So I guess uh, VT, we can, uh, let's see, we can just leave it in miles per hour, no reason to move it to anything else. This will be 60 miles per hour in the X direction. And VC is 45 miles per hour.
per hour. Does that look great? Since the sine and the cosine are the same, I just pulled it out. And all you're left with then is just figuring out what the numbers are. 28.2i minus, somebody say it, 31.8j miles per hour. So if you're sitting in the car, you look at the train, it appears as if it's traveling with a velocity in that, that direction. So we can sketch that out if you're in the car. And you look at the train, it's going to appear to have a velocity of uh, about the same in the two directions. So. Uh, just give it that length, minus j. It's going to appear, I guess it would make more sense to put that up here, above, because that's where the train is. That would be the velocity of the train relative to the car, something like that. A little bit in the uh, i direction and about the same, give or take a little bit in the j direction. And that's just what the train, the trouble we have really imagining this stuff is anytime we look at a train in a situation like this we also see all the other stuff we see the train track itself that's not moving we see the tr trees and, and other cars there that may or may not most of the trees don't move but the cars do uh, so it's, it's a little tough to just look purely at one object to get this this true sense of what it appears to be doing, <coughs> that's the idea we're looking for, is that relative velocity. It's a little easier to imagine in, in planes because there's no other reference thing. The clouds are there, but they're usually so far away that there, there's no reference as you look out at another plane. How about the acceleration of the train relative to the car? acceleration of the train relative to the car. This is a constant as well, so even if we took the time derivative of that, time rate of change of that, that would also be zero. So it appears to the car the train's coming nearer and nearer to it, but at a steady speed. So don't panic, there's an underpass there anyway, which uh, we obviously neglected to change the difference in the height between the two. Okay, questions on that before we try a couple others. Very straightforward. You need to just work with the definition of the relative motion equation and very carefully take each of the two vectors and you'll be able to put the rest of them together. We'll, uh, we'll be using this in some detail later. Oh, uh, there was something else I wanted to do with that. So let me just put it back up real quick. Trains here, going to 60. <coughs> Car here, going whatever it was. 45. <coughs> um, there's a, another way we can look at it too. If you write out the equation and then actually make a vector drawing, there's another possible way to solve it if you prefer. If we
we draw those vectors, the train vector looks something like that, maybe, whatever, however long it takes to represent 60 miles per hour. The car is going 45 relative to that. So, and we want VT minus VC. So that's 60, 45, at 45 degrees might be something about like that. And then this is VT relative to VC. And if you prefer, then you can use the uh, law of sines and cosines to figure out the other sides based on what's <coughs> known. So if you're, if you're more comfortable with that, you can certainly do that. Just have to remember the law of sines and cosines, which I never can. Plus, uh, this seems straightforward enough to me for uh, most of the problems. But it is a way to either double check things or maybe find things in other ways that that you uh, wouldn't have normally. Okay, that was a real quick aside. Uh, very few students I've noticed over the years actually like to draw the vector triangle. So. That's why I almost forgot to bring it up. Okay, so another problem then. Uh, imagine a car passing under a overpass from which is dripping a little bit of water. I want you to find the velocity of the drops relative to the car. What would it look like the drops are doing the instant they hit that windshield? <clears throat> All right, a couple of little details I'll uh, include. The drops uh, are coming from an overpass six meters over the uh, windshield, and the car's velocity is 100 kilometers per hour. So I want you to find the velocity of the drops relative to the car and actually sketch what that looks like. Next time. <coughs> so, uh, maybe a D for drops and a C for car, if you wish. What are we looking for? D slash C or C slash D? slash C, C slash D. It's not D slash C. Yeah. So I need the velocity of the drops relative to the velocity of subtracting the velocity of the car. Velocity of the car is easy. That's just uh, in the I direction. happens to be 27.1 meters per second. Just have to make the change there because it's not easy to get the velocity of the drops in uh, kilometers per hour.
how do you find the velocity of the drops? Well, with your constant acceleration motion equations. Does anybody happen to have that sheet from Physics 1? Oh, good. The rest of you have your tattoos? Right, have to make the assumption uh, that the drops are in free fall, so you know their acceleration, you know the distance, you know the initial velocity, you can find the velocity at the base of the six meters, and then you know the velocity of the drops. And, uh, if we say down is negative, it would be minus j direction. So for the velocity of drops, assuming constant acceleration, acceleration of the drops is minus g. That minus, because I've already chosen down as negative, the uh, initial velocity is zero, and the distance, the drops, all is uh, minus six. So then you can find the velocity of the drops after they've fallen six meters and then we can finish the problem directly. <coughs> Anybody doesn't have those constant acceleration equations from physics one, I do have extra sheets in the office. Have a velocity for that. The speed with which the um, drops are hitting the car. Sound about right? 10.9 meters per second. We make it a vector minus j. So. And now we can put the two together. Minus 10.9 j minus the velocity of the car, 27.1. meters per second. <coughs> Make a sketch of that. Um, what that looks like at the windshield to the car. And imagine you're in the car and you see these drops. You see it leave the the overpass, what's it appear the drop is doing, and you have to take everything else out of the picture, the bridge, the trees, that uh, thing you have hanging from your mirror, and what's it look like the drop's doing, as if you were not moving. It's easier to uh, feel like you're not moving when you're at constant velocity. It's harder when you're accelerating. There's the sensation of fictitious forces when accelerating in an accelerating reference frame. All right, we've got the vector here, but double check what it looks like with the other parts to it. The uh, velocity of the car is something like that. 
with the velocity of the uh, the speed of the drop being about half that, uh, no, closer to a third that. <coughs> So the two vectors look something like that, and the difference between them will look something like that, which is just what you'd see. It would look like the, the uh, drop is coming at you from a, an angle, slightly elevated, and coming towards you. relative acceleration. What's the relative acceleration? of the drops. Assuming free fall we do, and do we know the acceleration of the car? Well, I, I don't know if I actually said it, but I, I, if, if I don't say anything about the acceleration. We have to assume the velocity is constant, meaning the velocity is zero, and then the relative acceleration of the drops is just minus g. Don't forget, acceleration is much less intuitive than is velocity, and that holds true here with these uh, acceleration problems, uh, these relative motion problems as well. They're, they're much less intuitive in terms of the acceleration than the velocity. This, I think, I don't know about you, this I can imagine. It's harder to imagine what the acceleration is just by casual observation. All right. Questions before we make things a little bit more complex? All right. So still, all we need to do all we need to remember is right there, but now it will give us a problem that's a little bit more involved. So imagine a car is coming on to a freeway. So he's coming on to the ramp and then that ramp joins on to the freeway. One car here and one car here. All right, so the details this car, we'll call that uh, car B. Car A. Each have a velocity in those directions. And each is also accelerating. Of course, B is trying to pick up some speed. <coughs> Uh, a is not at all confident that he's going to pay any attention while merging, so A is actually slowing down. And then some of the other details we'll need. Uh, six degree angle like that, and the on-ramp. has a hundred meter radius. So I happen to 
draw it so that the acceleration and velocity vectors are vertical. Just to make things convenient. If they weren't, we can easily put the coordinate directions uh, so that they line up with one velocity or the other. It doesn't matter which. Uh, I just happen to draw it that way. So we'll use that as our coordinate directions. Uh, as we write out these vectors. <coughs> so, still need some values for those. So let's say uh, VA has a speed of 18 meters per second and an acceleration, absolute value of the acceleration, the magnitude. 2 meters per second squared. B is not quite as fast trying to come up to freeway speed. Is at that moment at 12 meters per second. Not squared. But acceleration 3 meters per second squared. All right. So find the velocity of B relative to A. So you do that part. You've got more than adequate tools to do it. Don't forget this relative these relative equations are full vector equations. Full vector equations. Don't forget, it's not going to be sufficient just to add and subtract the uh, magnitudes. There's occasional problems where that's true, but this is not one of them. These are full vector equations. This problem is very similar to the last one. Uh, you just have to come up with the two vectors and subtract them. Don't make your drawings too small on these. Lots of stuff to put in. <clears throat> if you didn't quite get the velocity of B straight down, then just tilt your x, y axis a little bit. It's an arbitrary reference. sort of on the fly, minus 12j meters per second is the velocity of b. Velocity of a, it's minus in both directions. We already have a minus <coughs> there. So I'll just uh, pull out the magnitude. And then it's cosine 60i and sine 60j. All of this in meters per second. All right, let's double check. We've got a minus from our relative motion equation. That's this first minus. The second minus <coughs> is simply because A is moving in the minus direction for both coordinate directions as I drew X and Y. And then uh, cosine 60i and sine 60j. Okay, that looks good. Uh, look all right, everybody, Travis, you got that too? Okay, so you can just 
chug those numbers, and we're going to minus the minus on the i. Minus 9 in the i direction, sorry, plus 9 in the i direction, and 3.6j, what it look like, and that's all meters per second. Don't forget the units on these. So B relative to A. So A, it appears to A that uh, car B is coming, well, pretty much straight towards them. Not quite moving uh, away a little bit just because there's a component of B's velocity <coughs> that's away from A, uh, but it's all taken care of. Okay, then the numbers check out. That's what everybody else got. Okay, that was the easy one because we've just done a problem a lot like that. Now, now do the acceleration. Because both of these do have an acceleration. What did I say? B relative to A. <coughs> Why is this different than what we just did with the velocity? Just different numbers, different directions. Why is this one a little bit different? One's accelerated, one's decelerated. No, nope. that we just we just handle that with the vectors. We just put a minus sign <coughs> in the middle. Handle that. There's something. There's a the, another layer of complexity in this problem. What is that, John? This car is traveling on a circular path. So it's actually going to have a tangential component to the acceleration. In fact, that's what that is. And it's going to have a normal component to the acceleration. Acceleration of B in the normal direction because it's on a circular path. So both of those have to be parts of it. My suggestion, anytime you have one or the other or both on a circular path, that you actually do this separately. Don't try to do the equation on the, as a whole. Just take them out and do them a piece at a time. It's a lot easier. You can, then you're working on a couple small problems instead of one great big problem. Because as you've seen, we can't lose any minus signs. We can't forget any other types of values we may need. So, so there's a, a component of B in the tangential direction. Well, lucky enough, that's minus J direction, so it's pretty easy. But there's also a component of B in the normal direction. It's perpendicular to the tangential direction, so that will be minus K direction. So that's pretty, uh, <coughs> pretty easy to, uh, helps us make it pretty easy to handle. So you set up those two vectors, and then you can just subtract the A, acceleration of A right out of it. Uh, a is an awful easy one to do, since it's practically <coughs> given. It's... meters per second squared in the I and J directions. So that's the acceleration of A, but I want you to find the accelerations of B. and then put the two together for the whole piece.
we have a tangential acceleration and that remember the normal component on a curved path is if it's a circular path we call it a centripetal acceleration and then put them all together for the relative acceleration equation got it David materials. So again, we're looking for the acceleration of B relative to A. If, uh, I guess if A had a radar gun pointed at B, it would be how the reading on the radar gun would be changing. acceleration of A. Oh. Right. It's, it's slowing down on the freeway, but in the coordinate system I picked that's positive in both directions. Tangential acceleration of B is simply the linear acceleration of the car along its path. Uh, well, not necessarily linear, it's on a circular path, but the tangential acceleration. So that's 3 meters per second squared in the uh, minus J direction. defines the tangential direction, remember, there is no component of velocity in the normal direction, ever. So that immediately defines the tangential direction, and I drew them parallel. So you don't have to assume that that AB is both components, it's just the, uh, the it's got to be the tangential component because it's in that direction. So the normal component we have to add on to it. This is not the full uh, acceleration vector of B. This actually is. This one we're coming up with now. <coughs> How do you find the normal component of acceleration on a circular path? B squared over rho. We use rho in this class for some unknown reason. Actually, I can just put it in. That's v squared v of b and rho. The radius of curvature is 100. And then those are in the minus i direction. Got to get all the minus signs right. Got to get the magnitudes right. So 
lots of parentheses, lots of units. Uh, that is meters per second squared in there. And so, what's that? Minus 1.44i minus 3j. <coughs> meters per second squared. Is that right? Got all the minus signs right there too? And then you can add these two together. Uh, in fact, it's pretty easy to add them uh, just on the fly. Um, it's minus a, so it's a minus 1i and a minus 144i, so that's minus 2.44i. I go minus 1732 and a minus 3 minus 4. 7, 32. J. Oops. Yeah, 9 there. Agreed? No, Chris? I guess, I guess I'm just confused because you're right. Given AB is 3, but then we solved AB to be bigger than 3. No. Because this is only the tangential acceleration. You have to know that because it's parallel to the tangential direction, which is the velocity. Remember, the velocity can only be tangential. <coughs> There's no normal component to the velocity, so that defines the direction. I guess it just seems like when you write AB about the vector, it's just the magnitude. It's the mag magnitude of the tangential component. You know, this is if, if we were uh, monitoring how the needle moves on that car, that's what you'd be calculating. Give me a second, reset the taper. There we go. All right. So, don't read too much into it. Uh, Chris, you just have to have to uh, realize that this has got to be the tangential direction. Since it's on a circular path, there has to be a normal component, so you have to find it. <coughs> so if you're in A, it appears that uh, B is has two negative components. It appears to be accelerating away from you. Mostly due to the fact you're slowing down, but also because its vector is coming around some too. Okay. Any questions on that before I clear it up? Joe? What do you have for your velocity vector with respect to A, B, A? Oh, I already erased it. Velocity of B with respect to A was. Uh, BB is that in the negative direction. A has two components to it, but it all reduces to, that was 9 and 3.6. J. <coughs> uh, is that right? No. Yeah, both are, both are positive. So if, if you're in car A, it appears as if B is coming towards you. Okay, another problem, we'll do one more, and then we can take uh, next another look at relative motion. <clears throat> okay, similar problem for you. Imagine flying along <coughs> a path like that is an airplane moving at seven hundred. 
kilometers per hour. And 50 kilometers per hour squared. So that's got to be then the acceleration. Not in the usual units we're used to, but fair enough. And then another plane passes it <coughs> following a circular path. So right when they're right beside each other, it has a velocity of 600 kilometers per hour and a tangential acceleration anticipating Chris hundred kilometers per hour squared. So no reason you can't leave this in uh, kilometers and hours. And the radius <coughs> Four hundred kilometers. One other piece. <coughs> They're four kilometers apart at the instant they pass. Well, it's it's very common for fighter jet pilots to fly at passenger planes just to scare the heck out of the passengers that are still awake. So it's a, a very standard maneuver when uh, hot dogging in a government paid for jet. So fine. Find the velocity of uh, B relative to A. Oh, I better label it. Find velocity and acceleration of B relative to A. So, Chris, when you take this class again next year, I won't actually <coughs> label that acceleration vector A, B. See, I, I avoided that here. Red is force, blue is dimensions, and green is auxiliary information. Nobody's taking notes in colored pencils. So when I first had a professor, I started using colored chalk. It took me about two weeks to figure out how to use colored pencils. Similar to the last problem, just some slightly different type numbers in jets instead of cars. So again, it's a matter of taking what you were given, finding the components that make it up. will become very, very useful to us in uh, a couple of weeks when we get into the uh, more, more uh, complex problems.
this if, if they're going to throw an orange to each other or something? That's pretty far. It's pretty far. It'd be a pretty good throw. No, they, they, uh, they don't actually like people throwing oranges between planes, which is why the windows don't roll down. Fresh air. Not really. No. Nope. Just leave them in kilometers and hours, no reason to convert to meters and seconds here. Used to units of kilometers per hour squared, but it's adequate. <coughs> All right, looks like lots of people have the, uh, the velocity one. So while you're working on the acceleration one, I'll put up the velocity one. Uh, B is 600. And if we pick a coordinate direction, maybe you did already, maybe it's that one. If not, it just means a minus sign usually. So B is 600 I minus A is <coughs> 700 J. <coughs> similar to the last problem. Isn't it? What the? It's not a TIE fighter. Again, this is very similar to the last problem we did. There's a normal and a tangential component to the acceleration of B. And you have to come up with both of them in vector form. So what's the tangential acceleration of B? That's what uh, minus 100j. <coughs> and 
add to that the normal component of the uh, acceleration of B. Because it's on a circular path, that is B squared over R. Kilometers per hour squared, squared over kilometers. Six hundred. Six hundred. Oh yeah, V, V, not uh, you don't want A in here. I want V in here. The units didn't work out. And that's in the plus I direction. numbers. What is that? That's a 900. Oh yeah, this this is 900, that's 100. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. So, uh, 900 J minus 100 I J direction, so it doesn't affect the I component. And uh, well, minus the 50, minus 100, minus 150. <coughs> Look about right. So if you're in A, looking out at B, it appears as if it's uh, accelerating. If you're in A looking at B, it's accelerating away and back a little bit. Okay, any questions? Don't forget this. business went on a circular path. It actually holds for any path. It's just <coughs> on a straight path, the normal component is zero. You only have tangential acceleration on a linear path. But um, don't forget that, especially on these, these curved paths. All right, we're going to start then Monday. Uh, this was unconstrained motion. We're going to look at constrained motion on Monday. It's not worth starting it especially since I can't do a meeting. So that's it.